Good morning, everyone. My name is Justina Benzan. I'm a board certified behavior analyst with Trumpet Behavioral Health, and I'm going to be leading this presentation today um, discussing toilet training with individuals with disabilities. Um, if at any point during this presentation you have a question, please feel free to use uh, the chat to present your question and I will um, try and get to it as soon as I can. Okay. All right, let's get started. Okay, so before we get started, let's talk a little bit about our agenda. So some discussion items. So some things that we're going to discuss is knowing when to start toilet training, um, looking for those warning signs, those prerequisites that um, this individual is ready to begin toilet training. We're also going to talk about strategies and guidelines for how to conduct toilet training, as well as problem solving when issues do arise. Um, as a reminder, when we're beginning toilet training, uh, you will need a great amount of patience consistency, teamwork, and some humor. Um, this can be really challenging and really frustrating, um, but definitely rewarding towards the end. Um, so again, that patience is gonna be huge. And we're gonna discuss a bit more about consistency and how that is going to improve the effectiveness of your toilet training. Okay. So when to start? Um, some things that we want to do is we want to observe our child and we want to evaluate um, if they can meet these prerequisites. So the first thing we want to see is that our child can understand um, some basic directions and have some uh, basic communication skills. And again, we'll, we'll dive a little bit more into that um, regarding communication skills. Um, we're going to see if our child prefers being dry, if they're physically capable of pulling up um, and down their pants, um, as well as awareness. Um, so a lot of children will demonstrate some awareness maybe by um, touching that genital area or they might um, look down. Um, another really common thing that we see often, especially with bowel movement training, is that children will hide. Um, so if you start to see, okay, like every time my child is producing, they're running to their room or they're running to a corner of the living room um, and they're looking for some privacy um, while they're doing that. Um, that's a clear sign that they're demonstrating some awareness um, of what's going on. And then we also want some desired independence um, and family life to be calm and, and less stressful. Um, so now that our child is ready, we also wanna make sure that we are ready as the caregivers. Um, as I mentioned, consistency is gonna be huge when it comes to toilet training. Um, if you know one parent or caregiver is consistent and another one is not, um, you're gonna see some challenges. And it makes sense, you know, if one person is putting on a diaper on their child and one person is setting a different expectation, your child, um, you know, they're going to maintain that that previously learned history of I, I go in my diaper. Um, I don't go when uh, my diaper is not on. Um, so having that consistency, again, is just going to be huge um, towards the effectiveness of this. OK, so now we're going to talk a little bit about strategies and guidelines. Um, so we want to prepare. Um, one thing that we need to be mindful of is that your child either um, enjoys or is indifferent to being in the bathroom. Um, so particularly, we're seeing no problem behavior. If we are seeing some significant problem behavior, maybe um, some tantrum behavior or um, elopement, your child is running away from the bathroom, that's something that we want to target first. We want to focus on first before diving into full uh, toilet training. We might have to do a little bit of desensitization to make the bathroom a positive place to be in. Um, the next thing that we want to make sure is that your child is able to sit comfortably on the toilet um, or maybe a little potty seat that's uh, placed on top of the toilet with their feet resting on the floor or a step stool. So we want to make sure that they're comfortable and we want to make sure that they're able to do this um, for about two to three minutes. 
Um, so research shows that this is probably one of the, the prerequisites that we're looking at before beginning toilet training, that your child can remain seated for two to three minutes without attempting to um, get off the toilet or engaging in problem behavior. Um, so again, if your child is not there yet, this is something that we wanna work towards. Maybe we'll start um, with just expecting your child to sit on the toilet for 10 seconds. And then as they progress, we're gonna increase that time. So our next prerequisite, um, we wanna identify your child's unique needs as well as um, their communication methods. So we'll talk about how do we teach kids to request the bathroom? Um, that's a separate skill, but we like to tie it in with toilet training and kind of um, kill two birds with one stone. So if your child uses vocal language, awesome. You know, that's something we can pair bathroom um, before going to the bathroom. But maybe your child uses a picture exchange communication system to communicate. Um, and so having a picture of the bathroom and teaching your child to exchange that picture to you before transitioning to the bathroom might be the route we wanna go. So whichever way it is, we just wanna identify um, that child's communication method and utilize that when we're focusing on toilet training. The next step um, in preparing, and this is a huge one, is selecting reinforcers. So selecting preferred items um, that your child enjoys. These could be food, edible items. Um, they could be tangible toys, um, iPads, whatever it is, um, you know, based on that individual. Because as we all know, while one child might really like Skittles, another child may not. So we wanna make sure that we're individualizing that reinforcer. And we also wanna make sure that we're using a very highly motivating reinforcer. So toilet training can be very, very difficult to teach um, in that we're teaching a child to become aware of their bodily functions, right? So super, super difficult um, to teach those internal awareness. So we wanna make sure we have a highly motivating reinforcer. Um, and in some cases, we'll talk about this when we talk about troubleshooting, um, maybe um, problem solving, but we might wanna reserve a reinforcer just for toilet training. So maybe my child um, is really motivated by potato chips and I'm only gonna provide potato chips for success with the toilet and the child's not gonna have access to potato chips at any other time of day. That's gonna help to increase um, the reinforcing properties of potato chips and help them to be more motivated um, to use the bathroom for those potato chips. So whatever it is, again, we wanna individualize and have that plan and prepare ahead of time. Okay, these are the reinforcers that we are going to use right now. Okay, so um, as you probably know, um, with ABA and, and anything we do, we wanna collect some data. So before diving into full toilet training, we wanna start by collecting some preliminary data. Collecting data for a minimum of five days would be um, sufficient. Um, if you wanna collect a little bit more, that's great too. Um, so something that we recommend is starting to collect um, data maybe in a journal format. So you have a journal noting um, what your child is eating um, and when they're drinking. Um, we wanna keep track of those fluids. Um, we also wanna keep note of when their diaper is soiled or wet. Um, so just a basic data sheet um, and checking at least every 30 minutes um, is gonna help you to get some data and some information to then um, analyze that data. Um, so we wanna look for patterns. So for collecting data, like I said, about once every 30 minutes, seeing, okay, is my child's diaper wet or is it soiled? Is it dry? Um, we're gonna see a pattern. Is this happening um, you know, every hour? Is this happening 10 to 15 minutes after having liquids? Is it happening 30 to 60 minutes after having a meal? Um, so we're gonna look at that pattern um, over again, the minimum of five days or longer. Um, and 
what happens is when we identify a pattern, we can then build it into this toilet training routine. So for example, maybe I'm looking at data and I see, okay, Monday through Friday, my child um, had a wet diaper around 11.15, 11.20 a.m. every day. Um, it appears to be the pattern. So I'm going to set that schedule that at 11.10, a little bit before when they're typically producing, um, we're gonna have a trip to the toilet. We're gonna go to the bathroom and we're gonna try. Um, so again, by looking at that pattern, that's gonna help you to determine what times of day um, you're going to be taking bathroom trips. Okay, so just as we were talking about, um, based on that data, we're gonna create a schedule. Um, we're gonna set that toileting routine and we're gonna honor it. Um, we're gonna schedule six based on that data. So again, you know, going back to our prerequisite, we wanted our child to sit on the toilet for about two to three minutes. When we're doing our scheduled sits, we're gonna set the same expectation that our child is gonna now sit on the toilet for about two to three minutes during each trip to give them a sufficient amount of time um, and opportunity to produce in the toilet. Um, again, we might, it might be a little bit difficult to assess a pattern, you know, before I mentioned, okay, a child that uses the bathroom typically around 11, 15, 11, 20 every day, maybe you're seeing some more irregular um, schedules and looking at the data. And if that's the case, maybe you're gonna set interview, intervals. Um, so we're gonna set bathroom trips every 30 minutes. Every 30 minutes, we're gonna go to the bathroom and we're gonna sit for two to three minutes. And then when that's over, we're gonna set a timer or look at the clock. And in another 30 minutes, we're gonna try again. Um, so you might want to set regular intervals um, as your schedule. Um, again, setting a timer as a reminder is super helpful. Um, and it's super easy. Um, everyone has a cell phone now and you can just kind of set a timer very easily 30 minutes from now. Um, it will be a reminder to you to then transition your child to the bathroom. Okay. Our next um, point here says waiting an additional 15 to 20 minutes could cause your child to have an accident. Um, so what we're referring to there is again, that we wanna be mindful that we're sticking to our schedule. Um, as I mentioned, toilet training requires a lot of patience and it requires a lot of consistency. Um, so we wanna make sure that we, as caregivers, are ready for the challenge. We're prepared um, to really dive into this and every 30 minutes, I'm really going to prompt my child to the bathroom um, because if we do wait um, and we're not consistent and maybe that timer goes off and we don't bring our child to the bathroom at that scheduled time, um, you could be setting up your child for failure and then they could have an accident. Um, so again, if you're going to dive into this, you have to give it 100%. Um, if you're not ready, that's okay too. Um, that's absolutely okay. Then we just wanna wait for a time that you are ready. Often I recommend um, for parents to wait until they have a four day weekend or a week, maybe it's spring break. Um, and you're off from work and you can be home and you can really devote the time necessary for this. Okay, so this next part talks about those scheduled sits and how we're going to pair um, communication with those scheduled sits. So remember we talked about identifying your child's individual communication method. So something that we want to be mindful to do is before each scheduled sit, we're going to prompt our child to communicate that they need the bathroom. Again, based on whichever way um, is their preferred method. So if it's a vocal response, um, then we can prompt them to say, say bathroom, they say bathroom, we immediately transition to the bathroom. Um, if it's through a picture, Maybe they touch the picture um, of a toilet or they hand it over to you, they exchange it to you. Um, I've also had children um, grab the picture and match it to another picture of a bathroom right outside of the bathroom door. Um, and again, the reason for this is that we're pairing that communicative intent 
with the actual bathroom. And our hope is in toilet training, we're gonna teach them to also initiate um, when they need the bathroom. Because having a child remain dry on a set schedule is awesome and that's a great skill. Um, but teaching them to request a bathroom when they need to go is a separate skill and something that we want to reach independence with as well. Um, during the time that they're sitting on the toilet um, for those two to three, four minutes, whatever it may be, um, you can provide some relaxing toys, activities, maybe some books to look at. But again, we want to make sure that these relaxing toys or activities are not that super highly preferred reinforcer. Um, that's something that we're going to reserve for success. Um, because if our child has access, for example, to the iPad, maybe that's super motivating to them. And then there's no motivation to produce in the toilet. They already have what they want. So we want to make sure that we're reserving that item, um, but they don't necessarily have to just sit there for the four minutes um, with nothing to interact with, uh, just staring at the wall or staring at us. Um, so we can absolutely provide um, some relaxing, less preferred items. Okay, I see I have a question here. Um, so what if your child doesn't have a problem with number one, but number two is a problem. Won't use the bathroom unless in a diaper. Okay, so that's a great question. Um, oftentimes when we're talking about toilet training, we do focus on urine first um, before diving into bowel movement training. Um, bowel movement training can be a bit more challenging, um, but that's a really great question. So something that we can do, your child's already toilet trained with urine, awesome. We're gonna focus on bowel movement training. And we're going to start pairing um, that production with the bathroom. So in this case, your child will only um, produce bowel movement when he's in a diaper. So what we can do is we can still redirect him to the bathroom um, while he's wearing his diaper. Um, I still want to collect my data and I want to see, okay, what time of day is he typically producing a bowel movement? And again, uh, maybe five minutes before that time, if it's six o'clock at night at 5.55, I'm gonna set a timer. And at that point, I'm going to prompt my child to say bathroom or exchange the picture, communicate, and we're gonna um, transition to the bathroom. He can still wear a diaper at this point. And the whole um, idea of this, again, is that we're just pairing production with the bathroom. So once we have that, um, and he's successfully producing in a diaper in the bathroom, um, we want to move on to try and have him maybe sit on the toilet with the diaper on. And again, he can produce in the diaper, but now he's sitting on the toilet. Um, the next step that you can do is you can try either removing the diaper or um, what some people have done in the past is to cut a hole in the diaper. Um, so now we're getting maybe a little bit more production actually in the toilet and we're trying to feed that diaper out. And over time, um, that hole can get larger and then we'll eventually completely remove the diaper. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, again, I know it's, it's, it takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of time. And we're doing, um, you know, we're doing this step by step, um, but that's how we're going to get the most um, results by taking it nice and slow and seeing that we're getting success and then um, upping the ante and setting higher expectations. Okay. Um, so for urine um, toilet training or bowel movement toilet training, again, we wanna reinforce those successes with that highly preferred item. Um, again, toilet training can be super difficult, so I do highly recommend reserving um, a special item just for toilet training. Um, and we want to make sure that we're providing that item immediately. So if we're waiting, um, if we have our child um, who is producing, but then we're expecting them to stand up, flush the toilet, pull up their pants, go wash their hands, and then they're getting their reinforcer. That's a little too delayed um, to make that connection. So we wanna make sure that we're providing that reinforcement immediately. So something I recommend um, when you do identify what that highly preferred item is going to be, 
I recommend you keep it in the bathroom. Um, hide it under the sink um, if it's an edible, um, a special you know, food, a potato chip, a Skittle, whatever it may be. Um, put it in a container um, and place it under the sink. That way that you can provide it immediately as soon as your child produces. Um, I would recommend also providing some praise. Um, you can individualize this. You know, some children uh, don't like to be praised for producing in the toilet while other children do. Um, so you wanna see what your child responds to. Um, if they find it to be aversive, then, you know, praise in that case is not reinforcing to the child. So I might just give them a simple good job. Um, but if my child, you know, gets um, super excited with the praise and really seems motivated by the praise, then I would make a big deal out of it. I'd be like, great job um, using the toilet, great job doing peepees in the toilet, that's awesome, high five, what have you, plus providing, again, that tangible reinforcer. Okay, once they um, have had access to this reinforcer, so if it's a food, um, I would provide a little time for them to consume it. If it's a toy, I would provide them um, with some time um, to also play with the toy, um, about 30 seconds to a minute, maybe two minutes, um, depending on the, uh, the results. Um, and then once um, they have had that toy for a sufficient amount of time, you're gonna remove the toy. And at that point, they can get up, flush the toilet, pull up their pants and um, continue with their hand washing routine. Okay, so I see a couple of more questions. So I'm going to answer them real quick before we move on. So I see um, a question regarding training. Uh, urine training during uh, nighttime. So nighttime toilet training basically is what we're talking about. Um, so in this case, I'm assuming your child um, is toilet trained during the day, um, but they're still having accidents at night. So similar to what you would do during the day, um, you're also gonna go all the way back through to the beginning and collect some data at night. So this is gonna be a little exhausting. Um, so again, I would recommend do it over the weekend um, when it's not so important that you get your sleep um, if you're not going straight to work. Um, so at night, you're going to set a timer and you're gonna check them again about, um, you could start with every hour um, to see at what time of the night are they producing? Are they wet? Are they soiled? Um, are they dry? And that's gonna help you to, again, determine a pattern. Okay, at 2 a.m. is typically um, when my child is using the bathroom. At that point, um, I'm gonna set my timer, again, 145, 150, and I'm gonna wake up my child and I'm going to um, transition them to the bathroom. Okay, so it's very, very similar to daytime toilet training, just a little bit um, more difficult in that it, you're gonna be tired. Um, but, but um, sorry about that, I lost my train of thought, but, um, but it's gonna be rewarding in the end. It's gonna be some hard work, you know, but it will definitely be rewarding in the end. I have another question here. It says, my son is on the spectrum and has ADHD. He is two years old and it is getting very difficult to potty train him. What would be the first steps to do? Okay, so we're having some difficulty with potty training. Um, something again that I would consider doing is looking back at the reinforcer. What are we using as a reinforcer? Um, can we reserve his most highly preferred reinforcer um, just for toilet training? Um, so that's something I would look at. I would also look at to see, is there problem behavior happening in the bathroom? Um, if that's the case, again, maybe we need to take a step back and we need to focus on some desensitization to the bathroom. So maybe we just go in the bathroom and we're not even expected to sit on the toilet. Um, maybe he's just expected to stand near the toilet um, for three to 10 seconds or whatever it is um, that you need to start at. So we might have to go all the way back um, to those prerequisites um, before we dive into uh, formal toilet training. Okay. 
So our next question is, um, if my child does pee, should we take him again in 30 minutes? What if he gets annoyed of the frequent toilet trips? Um, okay, awesome. So I would say yes. Um, if he does urinate in the toilet, awesome. We want to give him that reinforcement. But yes, we are going to take him again in 30 minutes. Um, if, he see, if we see he's starting to get annoyed with the frequent toilet trips, um, maybe that's something, again, that we want to look at those patterns in the data and see if we can do a set schedule. Maybe I see, again, my child typically goes at 1 o'clock. Um, they typically go at 9 a.m., 1 o'clock, and 3 o'clock. So I'm going to set those times as part of his toileting schedule. Um, so he doesn't have to go every 30 minutes but he has to go at those set schedule times. And the way, again, that you're gonna determine that is by looking back at your data um, to see if there is a pattern. Um, your next question says, he says I have to go potty when he is peeing and not before. How to change that? Um, so again, trying to pair that language um, with those bathroom trips while you're formally toilet training is going to help. Um, so it's great. It, it looks like he's demonstrating some awareness. He knows um, he has to go when he is going. Awesome. So now we're just going to have to try and teach him um, that awareness um, before he is going. So I would say as soon as you see, um, you know, if he is having an accident, let's say, um, I would still pair that, com that communicative um, that communication saying, I need the bathroom, um, and then again, rushing over to the bathroom at that point. Um, so pairing that language before those bathroom trips is gonna help him to identify um, and, and tell you when he needs the bathroom before he actually is doing it. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I see a couple more questions here. Um, I'm going to continue on with our presentation. I will get back to your questions, I promise you, um, in just a few slides. Um, so I will leave this up here, and I promise I will uh, come back to it, OK? OK. Um, and as you know, we're talking about this, we're also going to talk about um, some troubleshooting, some problem solving. So I may be able to answer your questions in just going over those slides. But again, if I don't, um, I will definitely answer your questions towards the end of the presentation. So our next um, slide talks about unscheduled toileting signs. So um, seeing again that my child may need to use the bathroom. Um, so some of those warning signs is that they might be a little antsy. They might be um, doing a little bit of a potty dance. Um, their legs might be crossed. They might be um, touching their genitals. Um, or they might um, have an accident. They might show um, a little bit of some wetness. Um, so if that's the case, again, as soon as we see those signs, um, we want to prompt that request. So we're going to, again, if our child is vocal, we're going to use that language. Um, you can say, I need the bathroom, and we're going to rush them over to the bathroom and have them sit at that point. Um, similarly, if a full-blown accident happens, um, which they will happen, um, I do want um, everyone to be mindful of that. Um, when we're toilet training, accidents do happen, and they're learning opportunities, so it's okay. Um, if that happens, we're, again, we're going to rush over to the toilet um, to hopefully get at least some um, in the toilet. If we are successful, um, again, we're going to reinforce and provide that praise. Um, if an accident has already happened, um, again, we want to remain calm. Um, literature really shows that we don't want to punish accidents. Um, we want to make this a positive experience for um, our children. So reacting calmly, um, you know, obviously if you're getting frustrated, maybe swap with the other caregiver. Um, sometimes listening to some music can help um, to keep calm. Um, and then we just want to calmly clean up our child. Um, we're not going to provide any attention, so no positive attention, but also no negative attention. And we're also not going to get um, a reward or reinforcer, um, and again, no punishment. 
Um, so very, very key. We're going to have just a neutral affect. Um, just be very neutral and transition to the bathroom and clean them up. And then we'll try again when that next schedule time comes up. Okay, so something that we also recommend doing, um, you know, previously we collected our preliminary data to try and figure out some patterns to determine, um, you know, are we ready for toilet training? What schedule are we going to put in place? Um, while we are doing toilet training, we want to continue to collect data and we want to continue to track our child's progress. So this is a very basic data sheet, um, but super, super helpful. Um, where simply you can put the date and the time, um, so the time that um, they're taking this bathroom trip, and what happened. Um, were they, was there an accident? Were they wet? Um, did they have a success in the toilet? So in that case, they were dry and they had a success. Um, or did we have a combination where, you know, they started to have an accident, but then they also produce in the toilet when you transition them. Um, our next column, is asking, was it self-initiated? Um, yes or no. So did our child independently request the bathroom? Did they tell you, um, I need the bathroom? Did they exchange that card on their own? Whatever it may be. Or was it prompted? Um, did you have to say, um, I need the bathroom to prompt them to say it back? Um, and then there's just some notes. Um, you know, the more, the more notes, the more data, um, the more information we have. Um, so that's super helpful um, in looking at that data as well. And then we're going to take this data and we're going to look at that progress. Um, as our child progresses, we can begin to only track accidents. Um, so that's something that moving forward when we're seeing, OK, our child is um, having a lot of successes or maybe we're seeing a combination of accidents and successes, um, we'll know when to progress. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the pros and cons um, to wearing diapers or pull-ups versus underwear. Um, you have a couple of different options here when it comes to toilet training. So if you want to use diapers or pull-ups, the pros is obviously that they're easy to keep clean. Um, so when an accident is happening, it's not going to make a mess in your home, right? So that's a, a nice pro. A con um, would be that it's difficult to realize when an accident is happening, as well as it could confuse the child. So again, this child has this learning history of I wear a diaper, this is where I pee. Um, by doing toilet training with diapers, I think it's gonna be a little bit more challenging um, for our child to make that connection, as well as it's gonna be difficult for you to realize when an accident is happening. Um, you might not be able to catch it in that moment um, because they're wearing a diaper. So similarly, thinking about underwear, um, our pros is that it's easy to realize if, it, if an accident is happening. We're going to visually see it, right? Um, and it creates a new norm. So under means peeing in the toilet, right? Um, new norm for our child, which is the new norm that we're trying to reach. Our cons is that it's more of a mess to clean up, of course, right? So um, maybe while we're toilet training, we wanna stay on some uh, hardwood floors. We wanna try and avoid the living room with the carpet. Um, again, some things to keep in mind if you're going to choose to do toilet training using underwear. Okay. All right, so some tips. Um, start by having your child sit on the toilet. Make sure everyone is using the same language. Um, so whatever that may be, maybe it's we go potty, or maybe it's it's time to go to the bathroom, or maybe it's um, I need to do pee pee. Whatever that language is that you're using in your home, um, let's make sure that all caregivers are using the same language when talking to your child. Um, our next point um, talks about um, what type of clothing your child should be wearing. Um, something that I would recommend is wearing light colored clothing. So 
light gray clothing is super helpful. And the reason for that is if your child is having an accident, you can see it immediately versus if your child is wearing navy blue shorts or black pants, um, you're not going to see it um, nearly as quickly. Um, so again, I would highly recommend using some light gray pants when you're focusing on toilet training and, and getting a whole bunch. Um, as you know, accidents may happen and we may be doing a bit of laundry. So if you're gonna focus on toilet training, it's helpful um, just to go to Target, get you know five to six pairs um, so you're ready to go. Um, the next tip is providing your child with extra fluids. Um, or fiber if you're focusing on bowel movement training. So um, the only way we're gonna get your child to uh, urine, to urinate in the toilet is if they are drinking fluids. So we wanna make sure that we're flooding them with those fluids when um, we're focusing on toilet training. Um, similarly, when we're focusing on bowel movement training, um, we wanna make sure that your child is getting some extra fiber so they're more likely to produce. Um, Bowel movement training can be super difficult if your child um, is struggling with some constipation issues. Obviously, you're not going to have as much success or opportunities for success if that's the case. Um, something to consider after three to six weeks, um, possibly changing the reinforcer. So again, thinking about using those most highly preferred reinforcers. So maybe my child was super motivated by potato chips and we started by using potato chips but now they're kind of over it. Um, they've gotten potato chips quite a lot and um, it's just not as motivating to them. So something we wanna do um, is called like an informal preference assessment. I might pull out a couple of items that I know they really like and let's see what they gravitate towards. Let's see what they play with the most. Um, you know, if I'm giving them a choice of potato chip or Skittle, I have a Skittle in my right hand and potato chip in my left hand, I'm gonna see what they are reaching towards. So you might wanna consider changing up the reinforcer um, after about three to six weeks. Um, the next thing to consider is maybe increasing the intensity. So maybe we're having, again, some challenges. We started with a set schedule of my child goes at 10 a.m., my child goes at 1 p.m., my child goes at three, and we're not seeing success. Um, we're having a lot of accidents, um, and we're not contacting that reinforcer, we're not contacting success. I might wanna increase the intensity. I might wanna go back to a 30 minute schedule. Um, in the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about intense toilet training. Again, if you are giving toilet training um, a sufficient amount of time, I would say, uh, again, after about six weeks and you're still seeing no success, we, we might wanna consider um, an intense toilet training procedure. Um, take a break. Um, that's another um, option. Maybe we want to take a break. We've given toilet training quite some time. Um, maybe our child just isn't ready. Maybe they're not showing those prerequisites of awareness. Um, let's take a break and we'll try again um, at a later point. Or we want to stick the course. Um, again, if you've only given it two weeks, probably not enough time. We want to stick it out and give it a little bit more time. Okay, so if previous strategies did not work, let's look to some intensive toilet training. Um, intensive toilet training procedures include, again, that scheduled toileting, um, reinforcement for urinating in the toilet only. Um, we're gonna have that combination of that communication training, and we're gonna do dry pants checks. And we might even um, purchase and set up a urine alarm um, it's an alarm that will go off as soon as your child is producing. Um, it's pretty loud. Um, so it's a nice clear sign to both you and your child um, that they're using the bathroom and they need to go to the bathroom. Um, it also involves increasing fluid intake as well as positive practice. Okay. So in summary, um, I want to first and foremost, I wanna observe, um, collect some preliminary data, see if my child is ready to begin toilet training. Um, I also wanna ask myself as well as other caregivers, am I ready? Am I ready to start this challenge? Um, I wanna prepare ahead of time, get these reinforcers, the toilet seat, the step stool, um, the extra pants, again, everything that you're gonna need um, to begin toilet training. 
I want to identify what reinforcers I'm going to use, and I want to have them in the bathroom ready to go. I want to collect some data, look at those patterns, and then based on that, those patterns, I'm going to create a toileting schedule. Okay, I'm going to have those scheduled sits um, paired with that communication, paired with I need to use the bathroom, and expect our child to sit anywhere between two to five minutes. And then I'm going to reinforce um, those successes in the toilet with that highly preferred reinforcer. Um, for unscheduled toileting, so what that means is maybe their, their scheduling, um, their scheduled time is 1 o'clock and then 1.30, maybe at 1.15, I start to see those, those warning signs, that potty dance. At that point, I want to transition to the bathroom, even though it's not scheduled time. I'm starting to see some warning signs that an accident might happen. If an accident does happen, we want to refrain from punishment. Again, maintain a neutral affect, a neutral facial expression. Um, we don't punish. Um, we're also not going to praise. We're just going to remain kind of neutral about it. OK. So let's talk a little bit about problem solving. Um, so here's a problem. My child seems to like having accidents or thinks it is funny to have accidents, OK? Um, some suggestions, if you're starting to see this with your child, is to consider how much attention you're providing during those accidents. So again, going back to remaining neutral, um, some children really thrive um, on negative or positive attention. Um, so we want to make sure that we're being neutral during those accidents and we're not inadvertently reinforcing them. Um, and we also want to make toileting more fun. Um, so here's an example of hitting the target. You have something in the toilet and um, you're having your child hit the toilet, um, putting some Cheerios, um, anything like that in the toilet to try and make it a little bit more reinforcing and fun to actually go to the toilet. Our next problem is my child sits on the toilet but does nothing then as soon as I put the diaper or the pull-up back on, um, he has an accident. Um, in this case, this tells me your child may not understand the new rules. Um, again, they have that history of when I'm wearing a diaper, that's when I use the bathroom, um, as opposed to when I go to the bathroom, that's when I produce in the toilet. Um, so diapers wick away the moisture and they make it more comfortable to have an accident. In this case, we wanna consider switching to underwear. So again, our child is really not making that connection by switching to underwear um, is gonna provide them with that opportunity um, to really go in the toilet because they don't have a diaper. There is no option for a diaper to um, urinate or produce a bowel movement. Um, our next problem here talks about um, my child never goes to the bathroom. In this case, we really want to consider increasing those liquids. Um, by increasing those liquids, we're providing more opportunities for them to urinate. Um, if your child is not big on drinking um, juice or drinking water, again, we want to um, try and increase that so that we have those opportunities. We also want to increase the motivation to drink. So in this case, we want to use highly preferred drinks. So maybe your child really likes apple juice. Um, so we're going to increase their intake of apple juice. Um, we can also provide some salty foods um, to increase the likelihood that they are thirsty. Um, so by eating salty foods, they're probably more inclined to drink some fluids. Um, as well as exercise or playing outside, um, that is also going to help our child to be a little bit more thirsty. Okay, our next problem is my child hates going to the bathroom. Um, so this is where we talked about, we're gonna have to do a little bit of some desensitization. We're gonna start um, by providing a reward um, for our child just being calm near the bathroom. Um, you know, we're gonna see where, at what point does your child start to get upset? Are they upset just standing outside the bathroom door? Are they upset standing inside the bathroom? Are they upset when you tell them it's time for the bathroom? Um, so we're going to identify where to start and we're going to provide that praise and that reward um, for being calm. And then we're going to gradually, again, increase our goal. So now we're reinforcing um, when our child is calm in the bathroom, when our child is calm in the bathroom and close to the toilet, um, when our child is sitting on the toilet with their pants on, um, pants off, 
pants off for one minute and so on. Um, again, so we're gonna break up those steps into um, small increments and reinforce um, and set higher expectations as they progress. Okay, so it says relax, it is a journey. Um, do not stress, but do commit. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, as I said, you know, toilet training can take some time, but committing to it is gonna um, help to reach that success. Okay, so some resources for you right here um, are some books um, that we recommend, um, as well as some websites for you, um, kind of reiterating the information that we went over today. Um, very quickly, I'm going to take a look at your questions before we wrap up to see um, if there's anything that I didn't cover in going over our problem solving slides. Okay. Mm, okay. <laughs> so this, this question says, my child is almost potty trained. Um, sometimes he runs to the bathroom to go pee or poo, but never lets us know when he wants to use the potty when he is outside or even while watching his favorite shows at home. And he wets his pants. Even if I ask, do you want to use the potty when he is in the urge to go, he says no. Um, so this makes a lot of sense. It's going to be, you know, very difficult for a child to want to leave a super reinforcing activity to go use the bathroom. Very common um, for a child to want to stay and, and play rather than do that. Um, so what I would recommend, rather than asking him, do you want to use the potty, um, be, use a directive statement and tell him it's time to use the potty. Um, you could give him a one minute warning um, before transitioning, because again, it can be, you might see some problem behavior if you're trying to, for example, turn off the TV um, and transition to the bathroom. So you're going from a highly preferred item to a less preferred activity. Um, so give him a one minute warning. And then when that timer goes off, you're gonna tell him it's time to use the bathroom and we're gonna transition to the bathroom, um, regardless if he thinks he needs to go or not. Um, so that's something that's gonna help with that. Um, Okay, so this next question is again about communicating. He just goes um, to pee on his own, which again is great in the home, um, but he is gonna have to learn to communicate that um, when he's in school or out in the community or things like that. So again, pairing that communication um, before he transitions to the bathroom is gonna help to increase um, that communication in other environments. Okay. Our next question is, is it possible to train the child um, for potty number two in one week? My kid is PP trained only. Okay. Um, you know, anything is possible. I do, I do feel it will probably take longer. Um, some kids do learn this very quickly um, and are thrilled to be wearing big kid pants and um, big kid underwear and, and remain dry. And some and other children, it takes a little bit longer. So everyone um, is different and everyone is individualized. So it, it's hard to say, you know, can is how long is this actually gonna take? Um, it really depends on your child. It depends on your consistency. Um, and again, how highly preferred those reinforcers are. Um, that's gonna be a crucial aspect to this. Okay. Our next question is, sometimes I feel he does not care um, having a wet diaper or underwear. Is there a way to make him really feel that discomfort so he is more motivated to not um, wet again? Um, again, you know, looking at this specific problem, I would recommend uh, staying in underwear. Let's remove diapers um, in this case, because again, a wet diaper, um, they're designed to not be... Uh, to not, to not be um, discomfortable to our, child, to our child. So we definitely wanna push them to just wear underwear in this case and prompt them, you know, when they are wet in their diaper, look, like it's time to go to the potty. I need to go to the potty. And again, pairing that transition with the wet diaper. Um, okay. 
Um, we have another parent here um, who says, my child is 10 years old and is still in diapers and toilet training has not been successful. He is nonverbal and does not make a request to use the bathroom. He still wears diapers. Okay. So in this case, um, this might be a case that I consider intensive toilet training um, for this child. Um, what's happening here is that we have a very extensive learning history. We have 10 years now. Um, in diapers and it's going to be hard to compete. So we definitely want to focus on some intensive toilet training. We want to reserve um, the most highly preferred reinforcer. Um, I encourage talking to your either your special education teacher, your behavior analyst, whoever it is um, that's on your case to maybe conduct a preference assessment, a formal preference assessment to figure out what are the most highly preferred reinforcers um, to use for toilet training with this child. And again, um, you're going to reserve those just for toilet training. Um, in thinking about communication, um, this is a child that I might, um, that I would definitely push to use a picture um, exchange communication. Um, for some children, um, something that can be helpful is having them wear it, either on a bracelet or um, having that picture Velcroed to a binder clip and having that binder clip attached to that child's pants. That way it's right there, um, literally on them, um, wherever they go. So if they need to use the bathroom, and we're gonna start with some prompting to teach them, um, they can exchange it quite easily. Um, it takes that response effort and, and lowers it and makes it a bit easier for our child to communicate rather than having to travel and, and find this picture and then exchange it. Um, so those would be my recommendations for that case. Okay, so I'm a little little confused about this question. Um, this one says how to get the confidence with kid in underpants that no accidents is going to happen. Um, I'm reading this as maybe your child is afraid that they're going to have an accident. Um, and if that's the case, you can again, just kind of encourage them that it's okay. Um, accidents happen. And again, really pushing that you're not providing any negative attention um, of any sorts for an accident happening. Just kind of again, being neutral um, when it does happen. Um, and providing a lot of praise and reinforcement for when accidents don't happen, when they are successful in the toilet. Um, so you're going to have that vast contrast um, to help your child feel the confidence that they need um, to wearing underpants and, and using the toilet. Okay. In this case, we have a, a child who is um, already set on a, a set schedule. They can remain dry on this schedule, but they're not initiating those requests. They're not asking for the bathroom. Um, so any advice on moving from a scheduled to a self-initiated um, training? Okay. So again, I wanna make sure that I'm pairing that request with the schedule. Um, let's focus on getting that request to be independent um, with the schedule. Um, and once we're seeing that, at that point, we can start um, fading out that schedule, maybe fading out one of the scheduled bathroom times um, to see if your child will self-initiate. And then so on, as they progress, we'll start um, fading the rest of the schedule out. Okay. This next question, we have carpet in all of our rooms. Is it okay to use underwear with diaper on top to avoid the mess? Um, that's one route that you can do. Um, some parents do do that. I personally would recommend the opposite. Um, try putting on underwear and then the diaper on top of that. So the underwear is gonna get wet. Your child is gonna feel that wetness, which is gonna help the awareness, but it's going to be soaked up by the diaper. Um, so that's one route that you can do um, to avoid the mess um, in your carpeted rooms. Okay. All right. Um, we have a nine-year-old with high-functioning autism. 
potty trained during the day, but hasn't ever been consistently dry at night. His bedwetting has actually gotten worse over the years. At this point, he has no dry nights um, and occasionally poops in the bed as well. Um, he claims it happens while he sleeps and is embarrassed and tries to hide it. He also wipes very poorly and ends up with poop everywhere, even when he uses the toilet during the day. Okay, so we have a couple of different things going on here. Um, okay, so again, going back to nighttime toilet training, um, we want to start with some data. We want to start with you uh, waking up. Um, every 30 minutes, every hour to go check your child while they're sleeping um, to see, okay, are they wet? Are they soiled? What time is it? Um, what time at night are they doing this? Um, something that you also want to consider when we're thinking about nighttime toilet training, um, if your child is often producing um, at night, you might want to limit fluids at a certain time of day. Um, so maybe dinner is at six o'clock and that is it um no additional milk no additional water nothing after six o'clock at night um you also want to prompt them to go to the bathroom immediately before bed um so that's going to help again to release um, those bowels so that they are less likely to produce at night um interesting about the bowel movements um, children, well, we all actually tend to produce uh, around the same time each day. Um, so that one might be a little bit easier to catch um, in collecting your data to see when um, the poops are happening at night. Um, so that's going to, again, help you to wake them up and then bring them to the bathroom at that time. Um, in regards to the wiping, that's going to be a separate skill um, that we teach, you know. Um, I might start with just teaching it during the day. Again, at night, your child, um, and I should mention this with nighttime toilet training, it's okay if your child is half asleep um, while you're bringing them to the bathroom, if they're kind of like, you know, a zombie walking over to the bathroom, that's totally okay. Um, and so when you're focusing on wiping, I would teach it during the day when he's awake, he's alert, um, rather than it's already challenging it already might be averse of waking him up and bringing him to the bathroom at night to use um, the bathroom so again focus on that you could use some prompting you could use some video modeling um, you can use some pictures um, a picture schedule whatever you need to to start teaching the wiping during the day okay Okay, um, so we have a client who, 13-year-old um, is cognitively only about 15 months. Could it be too early if we don't have those good communication skills? I'm going to say it's okay to focus on toilet training um, prior to developing those strong communication skills. Again, you know, focusing on getting your child to use the toilet and remain dry on a set schedule is a separate skill from having them um, initiate and request um, the bathroom. So it's absolutely, um, I would recommend, you know, the sooner the better, um, the earlier the better, as long as they've met those prerequisites and they're ready, they're sitting on the toilet for two to four minutes, they're demonstrating some sort of awareness that they're wet. Um, so as long as we're seeing those prerequisites, um, you can begin toilet training. Okay. So unfortunately, that is all the time that um, I have for, for today. Um, I hope that I was able to answer at least most of your questions. And again, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out um, or look at these resources that we have for you, particularly these websites, um, and talk to your specific um, clinician, behavior analyst, special education teacher, whoever it may be um, that's working with you and your child to help you um, put together some sort of individualized schedule and to determine when it's time, okay? So thank you very much. Um, it was a pleasure and good luck.